Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, budding technocrats. It's time to loosen the shackles that burden you and allow yourself just to dissolve into dreams of the future. Dreams of a world for a better or for worse, but certainly never dull, that's for sure. And here to guarantee that whatever the future brings, that you'll be more ready for it than those Joneses next door. It's the one and the only Matthew Dickerson. How are you going, Matt? Oh, what? and just quickly, the uh, little disclaimer there on the one and the only. When I searched on Google Images, I found at least five others. So you should know that five uh, other Matthew Dickersons out of a population of about eight billion. Oh that, no, I'm shattered. One and the only. I mean it very loosely. So one of five. Well, at least. Yeah, at okay. least. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy who's a footballer in America and there's another guy who is a real estate agent in America. And, right. uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm a, shattered. A news guy I thought it was well. unique. Now you're telling me I'm not. <laughs> there might be double T's in there. I had someone the other day when I was doing a radio interview that said something was mostly unique and I feel a Most bit unique. Rude. It's either. That's right. I feel a bit rude putting not. someone up live on air and I said, no, there's nothing that's mostly unique. Unique is binary. It's yes or no. It's, it's it's either unique or it's not. And he looked at me and I went, sorry, I'm being pedantic, aren't I? <laughs> but he could see you going to meltdown. No, oh, it's a binary. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, what's been on your mind? Well, I've been excited this week because I got to vote. And that. We all did. We did, exactly right, across the entire state. And that's exciting because I do love the idea that. The democratic process, you walk in and you put a number on a bit of paper and they count those bits of paper and someone gets elected on that. Mm. So I get excited by that, but I also get a bit frustrated because I had to go in to a polling booth to a bit of paper and With write numbers down on that bit of paper. That's right. And I know someone counted them initially, but then sat in front of a computer and typed in the numbers that I wrote down on that bit of paper into a computer, (laughs) and then they go through and do all that, and then at the end of that they say, give me the result, and bingo, it's done. And I just don't know why we don't circumvent that whole process and just go straight for the electronic voting in Mm. the first place. Mm. Surely, surely we can do that. Now, at the last New South Wales local government elections, you did have the ability to I-vote, so it made it better for people that couldn't access a polling booth, for example. So rather than the old-fashioned postal votes, which you still could have done, but people could choose to do I vote. And that seemed to be much better. I actually have a, a bit of property in another local government area, so I actually had to I vote. Well, I didn't have to. I could have driven that area and voted there, but I did not chose to I vote. And I thought it was pretty cool. I went onto the computer and I verified my identity and I looked at the ballot paper. And I didn't know a lot about some of those people, so I had links for each of those people I could go and click on. I could oh, go and go. read all the information they'd uploaded. Doing shopping. <laughs> exactly right. And I went through, and from all of that, I could vote electronically. And then I actually tried as an experiment, I tried to do an informal vote to see if it would allow me, but of course it wouldn't. So it made sure my vote was a legal complying vote, a formal vote. So that sounds like a good thing as well. So I just think surely in this day and age, we can do so much else online. We can gamble away millions of dollars in a heartbeat. Surely we could vote electronically. Well, we obviously can. We've got the technology. Having said that, at that local government election, there were three elections that had to be redone because of I vote. So Oh really? <laughs> let's not talk about that too loudly. Okay, all right. So <laughs> but, there's some refining that needs to happen. That's, that's right. But so, there's also, I mean, Dominion in the States uh, uh, they're, they're now you know, counter-suing uh, the Republican Party because of the defamation. Mm. So their their machines were all legitimate, right? Uh, well, there'll be people out there, and I'm apologies to those people who believe that the conspiracy is real and, and whatnot. Um, but there's still this distrust for electronic voting. Well, I think the thing even is that- despite the fact that this has been put to bed, well, not say put to bed, but but uh, proven wrong by Dominion, that they are legitimate and they're okay. I think the thing is that people are worried about some hacker getting in. And Mm. so I get some of that. I love the idea of voting from home, just sitting in front of your computer. But if you really think there is a lot of distrust in the system, then the next step that I would go with would be to allow people to walk into a voting booth, same way they do now, but rather than a bit of pen and a piece of paper there, then there is a voting booth in front of them. And America does this to a certain extent. So you vote and you know whether it's going to be a formal or an informal vote. You go to vote informally. It says, sorry, sir, this isn't a formal vote. Have another go. Or if you really want to be an idiot and just vote informally, then sure, click on the I'm going to vote informally. I don't care about democracy or whatever. But (laughs) you do that. And then if you really don't trust the system, you do your vote and then it prints out a bit of paper for you. 
And that bit of paper has the same voting. You look at that. Yes, that's mine. You fold up, put it in a box. At the end of the voting day, so 6 p.m., they go, click, 6.01 p.m., there's your result because it's already all ended mm. in the computer system. And then if someone says, hold on, that doesn't look right. I don't think that person should have won. Sure, you go and challenge the process and then go and do a manual count on yep, all those bits of paper, bits of paper. Yep. if you really think it's wrong. But if the result is a bit obvious and you think, well, that makes sense, that probably seemed like the way it was going to be, the result is there. It's instant. Mm. I mean, people like Anthony Green from the ABC, Election Watch, and all those other pundits well, that are about, out there. Yeah, six or seven hours worth of <laughs> broadcasting that you're just going to cut people out of. That's right. And it's the result is... just a single is, news headline. That's right. Done, <laughs> finished. Oh, hold on. That didn't really drag it out that much, did it? So that might be one of the processes that's minimising that, but surely we've got to get the state of the electronic voting. I mm. love the idea of it. I think it makes a lot of sense. And we are in 2023 after all. Surely, mm. surely we can just about get it right by now. Well, talking about, well, we're changing the subject completely, actually, <laughs> to disasters, or are we changing the subject? Now, disasters are not a new thing, but much is taken for granted when, well, I'll start again, we tend to highlight that um, much is taken for granted when a disaster occurs. It's We've got a global population that has swollen beyond 8 billion people with cyclones, floods, fires, and earthquakes, and when they strike... Larger and num- larger numbers of people are affected each time. Now, if you've been without electricity for a sustained period, you'll know that well beyond the anxiety of not being able to have adequate communication, there lies the very real problem of not being able to obtain adequate food, access to clean, fresh water, or warmth, or cooling, and lighting as well. So many things that are reliable, electricity supply would otherwise allow us to take for granted. So... Rapid and cheap solutions to power supply issues in times of disaster are of paramount importance. Matthew, there's a startup company now that has made a power supply for disaster relief their prime business, and it's a bit of a godsend, yeah? Well, it's a nano grid. And before I get started talking about the nano grid, I want to get something off my chest. Oh, can, is... I, can I, before you sure. do that, I'm going to just apologise for that ridiculous introduction <laughs> where we got tongue-tied at the start. But anyway, we're off and running. That's right. We're past that. We're over it. Good. We've okay. gotten better already. <laughs> now, what are you going to say? Nano grid yeah. is what we're going to talk about. But I've got a bit of an issue, a bit like the mostly unique, a bit of an issue that we throw the word nano in front of everything, and it goes to yeah. that other issue. It's just what we do these days. It is, but we throw the word gate on the end of everything as well. Yes, we Now, do. when we talk about gates, so we think about things Gate's like, a bad thing. Well, apparently, but diesel gate, sandpaper gate, chopper gate, when Bromham Bishop took a helicopter at our expense to a party, all these different things that happen. If it's any scandal, you just throw the word gate. Now, the thing that is ridiculous with that is that Watergate, which yes, is where it right. started, was the, <laughs> was name, the name of, the of an actual... That's right. So you've got an actual name with gate on the end of it, as it so happened. Yep. And so now every scandal has to have the word gate thrown but on the that, end of it. That history has become irrelevant. It's just, if you've got a scandal, it needs gate on the end oh, of it. Oh, absolutely right. Tech talk gate. I mean, if we do something... <laughs> if we say something wrong, it's going to be tech talk gate. But what happens now, the reason I mention that is because I feel we're doing the same with Nano. It's small. Oh, it yep. must be nano. Now, nano, nano, as you know, has got a specific meaning, 10 to the power of minus 9 in the SI system of metric. Yeah. That's what it means, one billionth, if you like. We used to do the same thing with quantum as well. Though quantum got confused for being enormous. People used to talk about quantum leaps and stuff as being enormous. Oh, yeah, that's true too. Now we, in fact, yeah. it's minuscule. It's, <laughs> it's, it's tinier than nano. It's an order of magnitude either in a positive or a negative or yes. in a plus or a minus or some way. <laughs> so we talk about nano, and this here is a nano grid. So I do like the idea of the nano grid. I'm just apologising. That's my long apology yeah, right, for okay. saying nano grid when it's not really something that 10 to the power of minus 9 will be in any way, shape, or form related to the topic that I'm going to talk about here. So I do worry when I see nano breweries. I've seen nano breweries, and I think, a yeah, nano brewery, yeah. how, what is that? You, you get a dribble or a, or a spit of <laughs> Something. Like beer. But I worked out that a nano brewery is smaller than a micro brewery. So, okay, I can live with that, kind of, because micro, yes, nano is smaller yeah, than micro. Yeah, but even micro breweries are misnomer as well, isn't it? <laughs> it, is, it is. Oh, when will people get it right? <laughs> so a nano grid. Go back to your intro, which is a nice intro about disaster. Yeah. You have a, have a disaster, a tsunami, a cyclone, an earthquake, any sort of disaster. Mm. We have such an interconnected system now of everything. Our water is typically piped to us in modern cities. Our electricity, you've got cables in the ground or above the ground bringing us electricity. We've got a whole range of things with telecommunications. So we rely on all this interconnectedness. And then when nature comes along, damn it, and mm. interrupts that interconnectedness, then we are in trouble. Well, 
luckily we had a power outage that went for some people for you know two thirds of a day or three quarters of a day. It might not have been a full day for anyone, but the the people were just. What do you do? Yeah, what are yeah you we were just that time? Yeah, crazy, you know, starting to lose control. What you needed right then was a nano grid. Yes. Because the nano grid is easily towed on a trailer. It's the size of a large caravan that you just hook up to a car and tow. It can be set up in about 15 minutes. And what it is, is a bunch of solar panels on it. So you set it up somewhere. And setting it up mainly involves folding out lots of solar panels to increase mm. the surface area. You've got batteries on board. So you can have some charge already in those batteries. Presumably you have it charged up, ready to go. And the solar panels add to that. You've got some hydrogen on board because you might want to be able to generate some power overnight, for example, or maybe if the sun's not shining, maybe you've had a large volcano go off near you and you've got lots of ash in the air, so you're not getting a lot of sun coming through, so it's got hydrogen on board. And with all of that, you've got the ability to output up to 20 kilowatts, which is probably about enough to maybe do four to six homes, Mm. six homes if you're not using a lot of power there. Well, assuming you're going to cut back on what you're using the power for. Yeah, you're probably not saying, everyone, go to their own room and watch their own (laughs) TV. (laughs) Turn on your air conditioning again and get comfortable. So presumably you are cutting back your spot on there, but it does more than that. It can also filter 500 litres of water a day, Mm. so you're getting some water there. And then you're also getting... a a little 5G network, so it's got a connection, satellite connection there, mm. so it'll bring in some telecommunications with that and then put that out via a little 5G network there. So it sounds like it covers just about everything you'd need, power, water, telecommunications, does it in a small scale, but you can imagine having the rural fire service with emergency headquarters they might want to set up somewhere. So mm. it's not even just... Yes, yes, it'd be... Yeah, exactly this, yeah. right. Not even just somewhere where you might have lost power. You might want to set up out in a bushfire scenario or an emergency scenario, set up a mini headquarters because it's actually got a couple of little spots inside the caravan side of it where you've got ability to just set up an office in there using all the Mm. power and the water and the telecommunications that are built into this particular unit. I'm not sure that they'll be great for keeping at your home for the next time you lose power for a few hours and you'll be able to flick on the nano grid because you might be spending up to about $375,000 on them. So you're probably not going to have it there. You might just have a generator if, if, yeah. if you wanted to do it just for your home. But the great thing about this is it can be transported. So a government agency, some emergency provider, maybe even some of the power providers when they might want to move it in somewhere when they're doing some emergency work, that type of thing, I can see it being utilised. But what I love about it is... But just to guarantee you your ability to be autonomous. Yeah? It does, that's right. And, and that's what I love about it. The things that are on this, you wouldn't have been able to build this maybe 10 years ago. Mm. You didn't, maybe you had enough ability with solar panels to get reasonable power out of those, but you just didn't have the battery capability and the ability to run batteries for long enough with that. You really didn't have the ability to run hydrogen and just the tele- telecommunication side of it and the potable water you can generate. I just don't think this would have been possible. Or if it had been possible, it would have been millions of dollars. But mm. producing that, even though it sounds expensive, for what it does, it's probably not a ridiculous amount of money. Mobile phones were at one stage said to bring a revolution to the modern classroom. Like any tool, they have the capacity to bring great power to the individual with a mobile phone in their hand. But with great power comes great responsibility, of course. And so many of in the field of education will attest mobile phones have rewired adolescent brains. Already many, many schools throughout Australia have imposed heavy restrictions on phone use for students in order to limit antisocial and anti-educational behaviours. So there is little wonder that New South Wales Labor government may be looking to potentially employ signal jamming tech similar to that used in prisons in New South Wales schools. Matt, being particularly careful not to kick a hornet's nest here, what are the details? Well, it's interesting you mentioned prisons there because I did go for a tour through a prison, not as a prisoner, as a as a person visiting All right, the prison. Okay, not this just time. To, just to clarify there. Just case, visiting this time. And not visiting any relatives or friends. It was actually a, a technical tour of the jail. And I actually handed my phone in before I went into the jail and I was about to walk in and the guard that was taking me the tour said, oh, is that watch you're wearing connected? I said, yeah. He said, well, it's actually an offence to take, take anything off. in the jail wow. that's a communication device. So we probably should take that off you unless you want to commit an offence and then come back and visit for real. So I took it off very quickly. But that was a prison <laughs> that didn't have mobile phone jamming technology oh, right, in okay. the actual prison. 
But if you've got that, then presumably it doesn't matter where you're watching, take your phone in, doesn't really matter mm. because you can't use the phone in there. And so somehow some prisoners manage to get phones into their jail and they seem to be able to use it and still run their business. So many birthday cakes. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Who needs Drop a file some anymore? Or, yeah, <laughs> who knows what it is. But in a school system, there are schools, and this is across the nation now, that do a range of things to try and limit the usage of phones in schools. So some of them use a pouch. There's a thing called a yonder pouch and you drop mm. it there. It's not like it's a Faraday cage or anything fancy like that. It's just somewhere to stop the kids touching it. But there are clips that people post that show you how to get around a yonder pouch. So mm. theoretically, you come in the morning, put in the pouch and it's locked up by the school and you can still keep it there so that you don't get your phone stolen or lost. But then there are these clips out there that show how you get a strong magnet to mm. undo the yonder pouch or even smash the actual locking mechanism on the ground hard enough and that will actually unclip the magnet on there so kids get around things. Yeah, no, kids get around things but just so long as the kids aren't, you know, if the kids aren't using it, during the class time, it doesn't need to be in the yonder pouch at all. It could be in the bag or anywhere, couldn't it? It, it could it's, be anywhere. The, it's the idea of having that pouch and the, what comes with that, I think, that helps to maintain the, the, um, the order, shall we say. Yeah, that's right. So I think one of the problems is when you try and put other – processes in place, kids are very good at getting around things. Mm, so yeah. the, the proposal by the new Premier, the was opposition leader at the time, but new Premier Chris Minns, was to just put a blanket ban on schools for mobile phones, high schools we're talking about here. But maybe technology is a solution rather than a mm. pouch or just saying to kids, don't use your phone in class or whatever it might be. And so the technology that's in use is that same sort of technology in jails where it does just block the signal. Now, when it blocks the signal, it's actually blocking via IME, so via the serial number, if you like, of a mobile phone. So it essentially, you set it up and it just blocks all signals from all serial numbers. But if you've got a teacher or a child, for whatever reason, that needs their phone, then you can actually use the same blocking technology to say, if you see this particular IME, it's allowed to go through. Okay. So it can be better than just blanket process of taking the phone off everyone that walks in the school or putting it in the pouch or putting it in your bag. It can be everyone... You're all blocked unless you've got a reason that you want to use it, and then we can actually allow that particular phone to go through and use the system. So a bit cleverer. Mm. There is a bit of a problem in that the Australian Communications and Media Authority needs to approve this technology yet, yeah. and they haven't done so. But again, we've got a new government now, so delivering on their promises, maybe this will start to be investigated quite seriously. So I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, but if they get permission from the ACMA, then that might be something we see in schools, which I think would be absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it will be interesting to watch what happens in the weeks that come after. Yeah. And I, I don't want to stir you up too much, but I just I do worry a lot about how kids would access chat GPT during class if they didn't have their phone in their pocket. Oh, I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck bristling. Stores, once a novelty theme park for shopping on a grand scale, are now very much the norm. For anyone who has little experience in retail as I have, it still comes as no surprise that stock take in any store, let alone the big warehouse type stores like Bunnings and Harvey Norman at Hal, uh, it's going to be a nightmare at the best of times. Now, if you've never been there, IKEA have some very, very large shelves that go very, very high. And those enormous shelves have to have their inventory taken every now and then. So, Matt, why the hell wouldn't you have drones swooping about doing your stock take for you? Why not? Why wouldn't you? Actually, I do like IKEA in that most people associate them with flat pack furniture and frustration with putting that together. Ah. But they're actually quite advanced in some of the things that they do and just some of the concepts they have around how they do yeah. deliver products to customers. Well, I'm sure they were one of the first to, to just basically have all their big shelves just out there. Um, they've got their floor space, yep. but then you walk through their warehouse section as well. Essentially, that's what you are doing, isn't it? You're walking through their entire storage. Why have out the back storage and then retail? Mm. Just walk on through and all your stocks are on display. It's no, can you check out the back for me to see if you've got that. Yeah. It's just all there. So IKEA already does use automated warehouse systems, and I've seen some of those, not an IKEA one, there was another company I went and inspected one day, and it was fascinating watching the order come up on the computer in front and then seeing the process where this device went along the, the racks and then picked out the particular one and brought it down and dropped it into a box. Could you hear that cartoon in. music? Yeah, the music. The dun, 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 well, they should have had that playing in the background. Yeah. I think the main music playing in the background were people who were employees there 
on the music they have while they're striking yeah, outside, right. saying, "Where's my job? Where's my <laughs> job?" <laughs> but they've they've been using that for order fulfillment for some time, and that's fantastic. But they've now got sixteen of their locations across Europe where they are actually using drones. They've got a hundred of these autonomous drones. And what they do effectively is they go out and they do exactly you said, check stock levels, go and check what stock's there, go and do stock take on a rolling basis. Or if you're trying to find a particular item, it can go and find where that might be. Sometimes items don't get put in the right place. Presumably it's a human doing that, not the mm. automated system doing that. So you might be able to find misplaced items or you might, the, the drone might see something in an area that's the wrong particular section for that and so then it alerts the humans to go and move that to where it should be but just keeping track of all of that using drones to do all that makes a lot of sense I, I just have to say that for the safety of customers there they're not flying around during the day they're only <laughs> flying around in non-operational hours but <laughs> let's figure you might be closing it no at six or eight chance of wearing a drone in the back of no, the head no right, that's right okay. and so you've got probably 12 hours till they open again. So it's pretty easy to unleash the drone through the night and let them go out and do the stock take. But a, a great way to keep stock accurate. And you can imagine mm. when you're a company the size of IKEA and when you're reporting all your information through to the share market, you want to have that information pretty accurate. And having wrong levels of stock can have a huge impact on the bottom line on your profit loss. So having that stock up to date obviously has been a focus for IKEA in the past. This is a way to do it a bit better. And I can guarantee if IKEA is doing it today, there are other companies out there who are developing this for their use, or maybe companies who develop this for just general use for various companies as a, as a product they might drop in rather than them developing the, the tool themselves. Yeah. Have you ever been contacted about paying overdue tolls? Are you like me and drive on toll roads like every couple of years? For me, it's an easy scam to pick, but there are no surprises here. Toll scams, texts, well, they're big business, and they've raked in a very lucrative fortune for the perpetrators in 2022. Matt, how can they still be getting away with this? I actually included this story because I got one of these text messages. Oh, I get them all the time. From a toll provider, quickly pay your toll, otherwise your car registration. We're sending the boys around to break your fingers. Yeah? <laughs> yeah they didn't send me that one. They all right. get really angry with you, but they were just going to take my car registration away. So oh, were they? Take your car registration away. Yeah, deregister your car, I think oh, it was. So. That's easy enough for them to do, I'm sure. Absolutely right. And there was a link for me to click on <laughs> where it made it very easy and convenient for me to go and pay. And I can just see I'm the same as you. I don't drive on anywhere that's got a tollway very often. So it was pretty easy to spot it as a scam. But if you lived in a city that had tollway, and you're driving on those roads every day, then it would be easy enough for you to go, oh, yeah, I don't think, I don't think my e-tag beeped at me this morning. Damn, mm. oh, gee, I better go and do that because I don't want to have my car not registered. I don't want to have the fine increase <laughs> or whatever other threats they might make against you. And so people go through and pay them. So we lost to just road toll scams. So forget about all the other scams that we often talk about. Just to this type of scam in Australia last year, Six hundred and sixty thousand oh. dollars. That's just on road toll oh, scams. Wow. So that's people clicking on that link, and they probably don't think about it much. They click on the link. It would, I'm sure it would be the same amount as you'd pay. I don't know what a fine might be, but let's say it's a hundred bucks. You click on the link. Ah, oh, damn, hundred dollars. You pay hundred dollars. You don't think about it much after that. Hmm. You, you haven't lost your well, life I'll savings. I'll just tell you that um, my wife did go driving through uh, Sydney and she didn't have uh, our e-tag in that car. And uh, she went through three different toll roads and each one was about 15, between 15 and $19 right. was the fine that we got paid. Yeah, uh, got go. Got uh, invoiced yeah, for, yeah. So, so they're probably doing the same sort of thing where it's just what you would normally expect. And after you've paid that, you haven't lost your identity you haven't no. lost your life savings. So you probably just forget about it. You paid your money and you forget about it. It might have been legitimate. It may not mm. have been. So that's, again, we talk about this often, that $660,000 is only the ones we know that are reported. What's the unreported amount? Well, if I could tell you that, then they'd probably already be reported. So you don't really know. But <laughs> yeah. I guarantee it's more than $660,000 yeah. because I'm sure at least one person hasn't reported it. So that is a, a particularly tricky and interesting one but it's just so targeted so niche mm. and i i just i do sit back sometimes and admire the ingenuity while then saying no these are criminals these don't admire any kids about don't them. get into this line of work that's right but, but to come up with the idea of going oh hold on road toll scams that's the go that'll get people sucked in we'll trick them with that one just general text scams in january this year so this isn't road toll scams now in january this year so in one month general text scams again reported ones 
$915,000 wow. was lost in just those That's the reported alone. ones, yeah, not again. the unreported. And most of the people that are being caught, at least the ones that are being reported, are over 65. So people are, yeah. they're not so much targeting over 65s. I think they're just seeing them out en masse. And it just happens that the over 65 seem to be the ones that are trusting. And that's lovely. Well, I also think you can get caught in an off moment as well. And... I've been caught before where it's just, um, oh, here, I've got this message for you. Can you just click quickly, click on this link? And I've, without thinking, just gone click. Yep. I thought, oh, hang on a second. <laughs> What's going on here? What have I done? <laughs> you know, too late. We did a story a couple of weeks ago about one company using special goggles to detect codes on inventory in their warehouses. And they worked a bit like X-ray goggles. And I think we may have stumbled on a new theme here at Tech Talk, and that is the pursuit of X-ray vision for the common man, as promised by the Marvel comics of the 70s and 80s. Matt, you've got another product on the lines along these lines to tell us about, but I'm going to struggle to get this one on my head. Is that right? <laughs> you are going to struggle. You don't want to put your head anywhere, anywhere near, near it, actually. All right, okay. One of the things that happens is that you might, in a medical sense, you might need a CT scan. So you go in and there'll be a large machine there that some organisation has paid a huge amount of money mm. for, and you get a CT scan, and that's for your Big health. Big donut-looking thing, yep. Yeah, that's right, and that's for your health. So you're going to do it, and you're going to have either your insurance company pay or whatever, Medicare, whatever it might be, but you're not caring too much about the cost because it's your health you're worried about. Mm, so that's right. you don't really want to say, I saved a couple of dollars there and I'm going to die 10 years early. So that all makes sense. But those scanners and the companies making those scanners are all big dollars, huge dollars. This particular story is about a company called Lumafield Neptune. And essentially what they've got is a scanner they've built, just a small scanner about um, a two metres by two metres, and it's designed to put everyday objects into it. If you want to see inside an object, stick it in there. Have a look. Just stick your big around. And I read a few stories on it. And one guy said he had a Polaroid camera when he was a kid. And he always wanted to know what was inside it. But he wasn't allowed to pull it apart. Fair enough, too. So he took a Polaroid camera, put it inside the scanner, and he could see in a 3D model exactly what was inside the Polaroid camera. So there are these little video clips now of people going and taking all these different things into one of these scanners. What they've said is that, you can make the scanners a lot cheaper than some of the medical companies like to charge. They're charging a premium because yeah. it's got medical next to it. So these aren't designed to be medical in any way, shape or form. But they're using that same technology. And if you want one, you can have one for only $54,000 per year. That's actually reasonably cheap. For a company doing development, probably not for you and I to sit at home and just put little yeah, household objects into. Yeah, this is an into. interesting thing to have in your lounge room. <laughs> That's right. Hey, come around and stick your watch in there and see what it looks like inside. We'll have a check it out party That's right. where you can look inside stuff. Yeah, we'll just charge you $5,000 to come. <laughs> so the idea with this is that companies that want to actually look at some of their products. So they're building new products. They want to see if the weld is done right or they're 3D printing a product. Yeah, and they right. want to make sure that it's been built correctly rather than doing stress testing on everything, which obviously is destructive stress testing. They're able to x-ray these things and look at the actual items inside and out, literally inside and out, to see exactly how they look. It would have been great, the old story about the Sony Walkman. Don't know whether it was true or not about a developer coming in to the boss of Sony saying, look at this Walkman, we've got it, and it was still fairly large. And he said, get me a bucket of water, dropped in the bucket of water, and bubbles came out. And he said, if bubbles came out, there must have been some air inside there, make it smaller. And the developer said, well, that was our only working copy, thanks, boss. <laughs> So let's get it out and get working on it. But maybe if they had one of these, they wouldn't have needed to put in a bucket of water. They could have just put it through an x-ray scanner yeah. and said, here are some extra spaces. Can we make it smaller by squeezing all those different things into those components? So I think used by companies like that, again, 54 grand a year sounds like a lot, but for those companies, not much. And they've already got companies like Trek. I mean, I ride Trek bikes. I'm a big fan of Trek bikes. Mm. So when they build some of their components, they're putting them in these scanners to see whether it's been built correctly, whether the carbon fibre is all been cracks and things, yeah. all, all those sort of things, yeah. So you can take those things at a reasonable size, a metre by a metre by a metre, sorry, a metre cubed essentially. When you look at that, then you think, well, it's a fair sized product that you can put in there to actually have a look at it. Uh, and again, this is where we're headed. When it used to be something that only the old IBM computer, I mean, there might be a market for six of these in, across the entire world, and now everyone's got multiples in mm. their household. These things are getting smaller and smaller all the time. And we're getting closer to X-ray specs too. Oh, yes, yes, we need to get a bit smaller. We'll, we'll get there, James, we'll get there. The AI 
race is on and Microsoft 364, 365 I should say, wants its place on the track. And they, that is Microsoft, will start injecting its AI elements into its famous Office software products. Matt, tell us all about this. Do you remember the little guy called Clippy? Yeah, the little paperclip. Useless. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He <laughs> was friendly, though. He was friendly. Had some nice little graphics. I'm sure they spent more on the graphics for Clippy than they did on the technology behind Clippy. Yeah, but he used to ask you if you wanted help and stuff like that. He was very nice like that, but then the help he gave very you nice. was just the normal help file. Yeah. So you may as well have just pressed F1 or typed in into the help. He was an advertisement for the F1 button. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's exactly right. But Microsoft were way ahead of their time when they had Clippy, and now they've got access to chat GPT they're going to start incorporating something like Clippy. Maybe they should bring Clippy back, I'm not sure, but nah. something they're going to call Copilot. So you'll have Copilot there side by side with you, which is going to be powered by ChatGPT to help you. And some of the examples I looked at, for example, in Excel, working out the present value of something compared to what you paid for that house 30 years ago and now with inflation and a whole range of things, there's a nice formula to do all that, but no one can ever remember that formula because you use mm. it once in a blue moon. You don't have to remember you just go to your co-pilot and say, give me the formula for this. And, of course, ChatGPT understands what you're asking and gives you the exact formula to do exactly what you wanted your to best do. best friend. And that's, that's exactly right. So Microsoft, we've talked about it before with Bing. They're incorporating ChatGPT into Bing to try and beat Google. Now they're looking at incorporating ChatGPT into their office applications Get some help on writing that new media release. Forget about writing it and then doing a spell check on it. You just go to your co-pilot and say, write a media release, please, on some new thing that's happening and give them a few details and there's your media release. So those type of things will be what co-pilot will be there for. Now, you can go and do it now. You can go out of office and go into ChatGPT and ask a question then copy and paste and put it back in office. But why bother? Why not just have it right there? And not as if office is under incredible threat. You've got Google Docs, of course, but Office still is the real market leader. But again, I like the fact that they're still innovating, still trying to work out ways Mm. they can continue to be the market leader. So I think this is really where we're headed, James. We're just going to have something on there and everything we do and just say, give me a bit of hand doing this, will you? Help me out. And it'll be there as helpful as ever and getting it wrong sometimes. AI will be the solution. Security features fairly high on the personal priority list for so many of us these days, and domestic surveillance systems are becoming much more common throughout suburbia. Matt, how big is the push really? What's behind it? And what considerations are governments going to need to really think upon uh, and get caught up on, I should say? Well, this is really focused on some things happening in Queensland and a couple of high-profile crimes contributed to a huge spike in demand. One Brisbane-based company said that they saw a 300% increase in sales lead after they saw a stabbing that was put on TV and they showed the perpetrator and the CCTV footage of it all. Then everyone else went, oh, wow, if something like that happens, I want to have some protection. I want to have some way of trying to catch that person. Mm. So 300% increase in sales inquiries as a result of that. One of the issues that you touched on there in terms of where is the law up to? The Queensland Law Reform Commission said that you need to Im- replace the Invasion of Privacy Act 1971, which gives you a bit of a hint about when that mm. was written or when that came into law, with the Surveillance Devices Bill Act of 2020, which has obviously got some components that are a little bit more modern than the 1971 Act. And this is the thing we see so often that technology is streets ahead of where the law is up to, and it's really the job for the law to catch up. But the thing with CCTV, the cameras are so cheap, the quality is incredible, and now that we've got the ability to put that digital recording device somewhere, I remember some of the first video recorders, sorry, the video surveillance systems I used to install, still had the concept of a videotape that you'd put in, and it would just re-record over the top, Mm. but you had to replace that videotape every couple of months, maybe every Mm. three months, because it just wore out slowly and then the quality that you recorded three or a year later maybe was terrible because it had been recorded over and over continually for all that time. You don't have that same problem with you've got hard drives or solid state drives sitting in these digital video recorders. So the quality of all that is so much better. And then to produce that footage, very easy rather than go searching through the tape and keep fast forwarding and then wearing the tape out more, you can just go straight to the time and know what time it happened. There's a date time stamp on the actual recording. There you go, Mr. Officer. There's the footage of that person perpetrating that crime. So it's certainly changed dramatically. Where do we hit 
the, the balance, though, between people wanting to protect their families, protect their houses, and surveillance. Because, for example, you might have a camera sitting up on the outside of your house pointing at the driveway just to see if anyone comes in, but that also goes across to the neighbour's yard. Yeah. And the neighbour happens to be a on drug the king who doesn't want people looking over the fence at him. <laughs> or for whatever reason, people may want to sunbake nude in the backyard, and yeah. good luck to them if they want to do that, but they probably don't want their neighbour's camera pointing yeah. over the fence while they're doing that. So there are all these issues where technology and the legal the system... yeah, to meet somewhere in the middle. ...start to collide, and it's probably not meeting in the middle at the moment. People are just going out doing it, and the yeah. law's got to catch up with that. So yeah. it is fascinating, but uh, it is certainly the way... In fact, when I watch movies these days or TV shows, I do wonder how the people in the movies, and maybe there's a lot more of them now, how they ever solved a crime before... DNA and CCTV. Because ah, yeah. every crime seems to be solved by, well, we'll get the CCTV footage of that and there we're, we're tracking that person going there and then do a DNA sample and yep. problem solved. And that's go. it. End all, of the all TV over. show. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Till next week. <laughs> <laughs>We both get people coming up to us challenging us about the waste that electric cars create without the slightest acknowledgement of irony. Now, it, it's like for all the problems that tech might create, all the thinking, all the problem solving for them that could possibly be done has been done and that's all and that's the end of the story. Well, it may surprise you to know that there are people who are actually really invested in this new EV technology that we have and want to see it succeed from all angles. Matt, what will I be able to do with my Tesla battery when it's no longer operating at the impressive level that it currently does? Lots of things, actually. Oh, well, what a relief. <laughs> Thank goodness. And I'm so surprised to hear that. <laughs> One of the things that is a classic, isn't it? It's like, wow, you've got that electric car, but what happens when you have to replace the battery? But no yeah. one, no one ever says to a car dealer when they're buying a petrol engine car, well, what about in a couple hundred thousand kilometres when the the engine's gone and I've got to replace yeah. the engine. No one thinks about that, but of course the battery is the big thing, isn't well, it? Well, the battery's got chemicals in it that you know, it could leak into the ground and cause destruction and whatnot, environmental destruction. And but of course an engine doesn't have any of that. An engine is just perfectly clean and can just go back into the ground or yeah, whatever. So, But the battery doesn't die when you finish with it in your EV. Is that what we're getting at? Correct. So when you've got a battery in your EV, you want maximum range. So you want that battery as close to 100% as possible. So your 500 kilometer range that you've got quoted for your EV, you're still getting that in a mm. certain period of time. Of course, what happens with a battery is that slowly, the same as your phone battery, slowly over time, your 100%, 500 kilometres, might get down to 95%, might get down to 90% after a lot of kilometres. We've got evidence of people driving a Tesla in the US for 1.6 million kilometres oh, really? on the original battery. Sure, it's degraded. They don't get the same range as they used to when they first bought it, but the point is it's still operating. But you might get to the stage at some point down the, the track 10 years' time, if you still own that car, for example, you might say, gee, I'm down now to 80%, 85%, whatever it might be. Oh, and batteries are pretty cheap now. I wouldn't mind replacing the battery in this. So, no, don't go and dig a hole in the backyard and bury a battery. No. <laughs> don't go and throw your hands up in the air and say, I've just destroyed the environment. The first thing that's going to happen before recycling is reuse. And there's a company or the researchers at Oak Ridge National Laboratory have come up with some clever technology that will be used for examples like this. So the first thing they'll be used for is for some energy storage, some battery storage for grid systems. So, for example, solar panels might charge up more than they need during the day. And then at night time, when they need power, you've got batteries there that are going to keep injecting that power into the grid, for example. So that's one place you might also use them in a home grid system, home battery, for example, using solar panels during the day, that type mm. of thing. But this particular company has taken the idea of different batteries from different manufacturers and at different levels of discharge or different conditions, if you like, and tied them all together into a clever system that can still utilise the power from all of those, balance the power out using little subsets of those batteries so that you're actually still able to get a battery that might be at 85% and a battery that might be at 75% and still usefully use the power out of those to get them down to zero together. So it's just mm. really tying that together. So that's going to be the first thing that we'll do. There was one report that said there will be about 1.2 million tonnes of retired EV batteries across the world by the year 2030. But again, they'll be used in some other system, like a grid system. And eventually... Yeah, it doesn't have to mean landfill. No, it doesn't. Because after that next 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years of useful life in another life, as in 
maybe using it for grid battery systems, you can then recycle it. So that's when you'd break it down to its core components and say, mm. oh, look, we've got some lithium. Maybe we could use that in a new battery, for example. But approximately 97% of the components, when they're broken down, can be reused in that. So you're not really burying a whole lot. Mm. You might be burying 3% at most after maybe 40 years. And I always laugh at people that go on, as you talk about, because the alternative is, well, let's forget about them and just keep being petrol. Is that yeah. the best alternative? Because in 40 years' time, so you might the future be, is backwards. That's right. You might have to bury 3% of this battery, then let's just keep burning petrol. That'll all be okay. Yeah. Matt, I've got to confess, I'm not a fan of touchpads on laptops. I'll use them, but it'll be under sufferance. Change my mind. What could possibly make me happier about using a mouse pad over using a mouse? <laughs> well, there's this, your challenge. This, this is a mouse pad just to sit your mouse on. Oh, sorry. So it's not a touch pad it's that I was reading. Pad. Oh, okay. No, so right. I completely stuffed that whole intro up. <laughs> what a surprise for this afternoon. <laughs> so we are solving the big problems here on Tech Talk. Good. And one of the big problems is that sometimes your mouse just isn't fast enough. When I'm trying to go from one cell in Excel to another cell in Excel, I want to be able to get there as quick as I possibly can. At lightning speed. At lightning speed. That's exactly (laughs) right. And sometimes if I'm just using a mouse on a desk or a normal mouse pad, it's just not quick enough. So... What about if you're using... Practically, if you're using three screens and you need to get from the very far left-hand side to the very far right-hand side... Now you're talking. You're you're hearing me. You're hearing me. Okay. All right. This is fast-moving mice. This is is the solution that I've got for you because we do like to solve the big problems. This is a glass mouse pad. Now, the problem I have with glass and and a mouse from time to time is if I go to a motel and I pull out my portable mouse that I travel with, it's a laser mouse, and of course I put it on the glass desk that's in a motel regularly, and it goes straight through the glass and it doesn't work. So I've got to find a piece of paper to clumsily tuck underneath my uh, my notepad and then actually use it sitting on that. So it's all a bit clumsy. This glass mouse pad, which I'm not sure that I'll travel with because it is glass after all, but (laughs) this glass mouse pad is not transparent. It's opaque so that a laser mouse can still sit on it and use it while you're working away on your notebook beside there. But because it's glass, because it's super smooth and it's got an anti-slip rubber base underneath the glass, then you can move your mouse faster than ever before. I must admit, it probably is aimed at gamers more yeah, than okay. people using Excel. Ah, right. Okay. So if you need to move your mouse around pretty yeah. fast in a game, because some games still like to use a mouse, and they still rather than a joystick, for example, yeah. and you still want to be able to move around pretty quickly on that, that's where this is aimed at. And no surprise that Razer, who do make some nice gaming notebooks, Razer makes this particular glass mouse pad. Five millimeters thick, tempered glass, as I said, anti-slip rubber base, opaque, so that it can have a, a laser mouse bounce off it. This is something that I thought was definitely needed by gamers. But then I thought, there's a problem. You're going to be sweating while you're using this mouse pad at yeah. lightning speed. And you're probably not dressed in a suit when you're using it. So you've probably got short sleeves on. So you might get a bit sweaty and your arm might start to stick this beautiful, smooth glass <laughs> mouse pad. So they also offer you gaming-specific sleeves. Sleeves? That you can put on. And gloves, perhaps? Well, or just, they, just sleeves? Just the, sleeves. Apparently, the, the hand itself is over the mouse, so it's not really sticking oh, that much. Okay. But the sleeve, so your forearm tends to stick on the glass mouse pad because it is so smooth and perfect there. <laughs> so you put your <laughs> gaming sleeve on, have your mouse poised there, ready to go on your glass mouse pad, and you now can move your mouse at lightning speed. Just thinking about when the, the day they were testing the prototypes and the guy there was using this mouse and he was. Came out my half is my forearm kept sticking to that glass <laughs> stupid mouse pad. Right, right, I've got a solution for you. Put on this. <laughs> I'm sure it went through that process. Rather than throw out the glass mouse pad, we need a gaming sleeve. Well, this so, is this is this is top notch mouse pattery. We, we we are talking that here, and I think the sleeve can actually go over a couple of your fingers as well. Oh, to right. Just keep those. Yeah, have to go over the wrist with the, it because the wrist can lean on the glass. That's there, right. So that's not a the whole Leave sweat hand. marks and things. Yeah. So this is the thing. So if you if this has been a problem for you up to this point in time, well, it hasn't. Well, well, well that's a shame because <laughs> I was hoping to solve a problem for you today. But if it had have been but for one of our lucky listeners, it has been a problem. Correct. And they are like. Ear to the to the um, my, not the microphone the um, speaker <laughs> right now. I do I do want to travel with one because I do have that problem at motels regularly. It is oh, frustrating. Oh, it okay, is, with All the right. glass transparent glass, 
And so I do want to travel alone, but I'm just not sure how good it would be. And if I get my I, my backpack, which cover, carries my notebook around in it, and I pull that out at the end of a plane trip, and I go, I've just got lots of shattered tempered glass. Oh, now. yeah, of course. I'm not sure how much fun that would be. But look, we can live in hope, I suppose. And that is where we'll end it this week, folks. Right in the sweet spot where we leave the cool new gadgets. Right there in your hippocampus where all the best memories can be found. All wrapped up snug and tight right next to the amygdala where the warm feelings are kept. Thanks for another cracking tech talk, Matt. Good I've got to go. I've got to go. I've just got a text, sorry. So I've just got to go and respond to this text and go, and pa- I've got a toll fine. I've just got to pay oh, this quickly. Okay. So well, I'll be back. I'll be no, back. Just click on the link. You'll be right. <laughs> Good work has been done today, folks. Me, I'm off to stare out the window and dream of a day when x-ray goggles will be as cheap and convenient as a pair of truck stop sunnies. Then I'll be the coolest kid in school and I'll no longer need that Charles Atlas chest expander that hasn't stopped the bullies from kicking sand in my face. (sighs) Thanks for joining us uh, again today, folks. We really appreciate it. My name is James Eddy and as always, it is a pleasure to bring you Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Keep tuning in to get your head start into a brighter future and bring a friend along to ride for the next time. Until next week, take care. See you soon.